So following this talk, there will be an opportunity to ask Dr. Kulatungang questions. So please submit your questions throughout the talk using the chat function. And I will then collate uh, the submitted questions and put them uh, to Dr. Kulatungang on your behalf following his presentations. Uh, sorry, his presentation. Uh, <laughs> We would love to have more, but yeah, maybe that's an all day. <laughs> so now I am delighted to introduce to you our speaker. So Dr. Gladius Kolatungang teaches, researches and facilitates business and social innovation and entrepreneurship and management in the UK, Europe and Asia. He obtained his PhD in social entrepreneurship in Roskill University, where he has also been a visiting lecturer. That's in Denmark. He was a senior lecturer at the University of East London and is currently a fellow of the Innovation I3 Centre at the University of Greenwich and an MBA program manager and senior lecturer at the University of Wales Trinity St. David in London. So Gladius has a practitioner background. He has initiated and led several businesses, NGOs and social enterprises and has held top management positions as MD, CEO or CEO among others in the private, public and voluntary sectors in Asia and Europe. Dr. Kolitz Hungan is also an expert in higher education course design, having created a BA in social enterprise, the very first kind of it globally, as well as an MA in social enterprise, health and social care for the University of East London. The BA Social Enterprise Programme, also known as Com University, delivered in collaboration with a leading social enterprise in East London, worked with community workers across London and built their capacity to initiate, set up and operate businesses and social enterprises across the different London boroughs. Many of these social enterprises have become extremely successful generating sustainable livelihood for marginalized people locally and winning national awards. Uh, Gladius uh, has been invited across the world, so places like Vietnam, Tanzania, Japan, India and the Middle East to train budding entrepreneurs and to facilitate the teaching of business and social entrepreneurship in formal and civil society settings. So Dr. Gladius, besides academic publications, has also published several book chapters and co-edited a book on management that I hope uh, he can tell us more about. And finally, something that I have found very interesting, Dr. Gladius, you have a skill set including um, filmmaking and television production, having made mainstream movies in South India and being executive producer in a prime time English TV drama in Singapore. So that's an interesting bit that I hope you can tell us more about too. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Kolatungan. Uh, if you're ready, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Christina, for the uh, introduction. A lot of kind words you have used about me. Uh, shall I start uh, sharing the screen, Ella? Yeah, I would say yes. let's, let's go for it, yeah. Okay, that's a good idea, right? Okay. Are we there now? Uh, almost there, I think. Uh, yeah, I can see it now, yeah. Okay, um, let me start with a story. And the story is about uh, a little boy in South India, say about eight years old, who had to walk to school every day, four miles, to and fro. And he normally used to pass through the main village street, which looks something like this, you know, proper houses, styled roofs, and some houses with two stories and so on. And after he exits his village, he walks through a forest for about a mile. And after the forest, he comes across a shanty town like this. Now, this is a typical feature of many Indian rural settings because this is the place where the lowest caste people 
called the Dalits live. They are untouchables. They do the menial work for the main village people, but they are completely isolated. They cannot draw water from the wells of the main village. They cannot send their children to the schools in the village, so on and so forth. They can't, they can't worship in the local temples and so on. And as he crosses this village, he sees things like this. Children playing on the mud on the road. And some of the other children, he watches as he crosses this and goes through a riverbed and crosses to the other side into the town. And he sees children, most of who come from this uh, lowest caste group, working as uh, construction laborers. And you can see that uh, this is uh, a dangerous demeaning and debilitating work. You know, in some cases, it even stunts their growth. And one of the other uh, jobs that these children do is rag picking. You know, they pick rags and try to see if they can salvage anything of value and then find uh, some buyer for it, okay? And you can see some girls who are hardly seven or eight who are again, you know, doing construction work. Now, when he sees all this, it's as if inequality is laid out as an installation art. You know, he leaves his village, which is reasonably well off. And then he goes through this uh, shanty town, which is called a Dalit colony. And then he comes up on the other side, there is another Dalit colony and another prim and proper village. And he has these two questions. Why is there extreme inequality in the world? And can anything be done to solve this problem? Now he goes to his mother who happens to be a Seventh-day Adventist, you know, a kind of a cultish Christian group and asks her, mom, why is there extreme inequality in the world? And uh, the lady, you know, bless her. She says, look, their fathers and forefathers have committed sins and God is punishing them. And then this doesn't sit well with him. And he says, there should be some other explanation. It can't be just, uh, you know, a curse uh, brought upon their families by God. And God is supposed to love everybody. And why is he doing this to a particular group of people? So this question kind of, uh, revolves in his uh, mind for a, for some time to come. Uh, that young boy is uh, none other than myself. And uh, I, I used to grapple with this question. And this was uh, burning inside me for a very long time. And I was also asking myself, why is there no transport in this uh, village to go to the town so that other people also can take the bus and go? And then suddenly next to the village, uh, a Coke factory was set up and local people got employed in the Coke factory. And this brought about some significant changes that the little boy observed. Now, even those Harijans or Dalits as they are called, the lower caste people, they were able to mingle with people from other castes and work together with them. And that he thought was very interesting. You know, these people who were kept at arm's length, who could not worship in the temples of the main village, were now working side by side, you know, villages from the main village, from the higher caste, people from the higher caste. And then this brought about changes in the neighborhood. Suddenly a market sprang up. And then there was another fancy good stores and other stores that came into being. And in this, in, in my mind, I'm, I'm transiting from his to my, in my mind, it seeded an idea, which is, uh, sorry, um, this particular uh, picture is about how, you know, it, it also brought about a uh, transport uh, because the factory was bringing in workers from the town as well, you know, so he stopped walking <laughs> and he started using the uh, local bus. So the, what uh, made an impression uh, with this experience was that 
there is power in enterprise and business and the the power is in terms of how the neighborhood can be transformed by a business and enterprise that gets set up in the neighborhood and this particular idea took root in my mind and i was asking myself okay if the business and enterprise that is set up in a village setting can transform the ecosystem of the village what about solving social problems so that became uh, a burning question uh, in me and what my mother talked about you know god intervening in people's lives uh, to, to solve social problems that was not going to uh, cut uh, any eyes with me so i started looking at how the power of enterprise can be deployed to transform people's lives to transform neighborhoods and communities so that became a kind of a passion and i went on to do uh, degrees in physics and engineering but my first serious involvement was in international development when i joined um, an ngo uh, who were working in community development in the rural areas and i'll talk a little bit more about that a little later now let's get into this idea of you know can business and enterprise solve social problems what do you think do, do, when someone asks you can business and enterprise solve social problems what will uh, be your answer in my particular case gladius i would say yes <laughs> i think okay. they have quite a lot of power these days uh, especially for that I yeah would... okay that's a that's a good start okay let's look at uh, some of the answers for that question okay when i look at this picture what comes to mind what what is what is this picture what story does this picture tell you very expensive coffee i know <laughs> up market right <laughs> okay anything else that stands out for you okay let me tell you what it is all about this is like any other normal yuppie kind of cafe but most of the people who work here have a history most of them have come from either homeless background or they have come out of prisons now this enterprise is an enterprise that trains these people who otherwise have no chance of being included in society and they are given training to become chefs waitresses accountants and so on okay so this is called skylight cafe which is an inspirational social enterprise in east london uh, and basically it provides a route into work and mainstream employment so that they can become part of the mainstream employment force uh, labor force and the cafe opened in 2004 and uh, they have uh, worked with more than 400 people through the program and now this cafe has been shifted to oxford now it's running in oxford and successfully so this is one example of how a normal business can become a route for offering sustainable livelihoods to people who are in the margins of society and i just wanted to give you a, a feel of what kind of areas in which social enterprises are working in the uk and uh, nene clinical commissioning group is an example of how uh, some gps have come together and formed this clinical group and they are catering to a population of more than 600000 uh, people across northamptonshire on behalf of nhs and their annual budget is around 600 million pounds they make profits but the profits are plowed back into the organization and all the uh, employees are paid market rates and very good bonuses as well and community energy warwickshire uh, is you know uh, this was set up in 2010 uh, when incentives for renewable renewable energy was available and uh, they are working as a kind of a cooperative 
all the, uh, they supply power to the local community and every uh, community member owns a share in this uh, group. And this is uh, a health uh, enterprise, which is an employee-led social enterprise delivering essential cardiac and pulmonary rehabilitation services for heart and lung patients. I can go on and on and give you so many examples. Now, let me shift uh, the gear a little bit and go to some experiences from the third world. When you see this group of people, what strikes you? What is distinctly different or anything that stands out for you? Looks like they have sight problems. Exactly, exactly. They, ha they are visually impaired people. And uh, this is uh, a group of uh, blind persons from Nepal. And uh, you know, when people get uh, visually impaired, automatically some of their other senses get, you know, acutely sharper, you know. So there was uh, this couple who went from UK to Nepal, who saw these uh, people begging in the streets and a kind of an idea flashed in their mind. They said, these people who are visually impaired will be very good with their, with their hands so they formed an organization called Seeing Hands. They trained them uh, in professional massage techniques and they opened a part. And you can see Rob Ainley who was at the back. He formed this and now it has become a successful and sustainable social enterprise and they have seeded other social enterprises as well. So training, employment opportunities and more than that it is a self-sustaining um, social enterprise which is offering sustainable livelihoods. Um, of course you know it's uh, an independently running organization and they have kind of scaled down their support from international founders. Now they have become self-sustaining. They have four massage clinics um, across uh, Nepal. And what they do is they reinvest their profits into training more visually impaired uh, persons. So that is the story of uh, seeing hands. Now, this is just to say that how, you know, the social exclusion of the blind people in Nepal used to be very extreme. You know, they used to uh, either sing in restaurants for money or beg in the streets. But now all these people who are running the Seeing Hands Enterprise are independent and they are, they are supporting their families as well. And this has resulted in the social stigma uh, against uh, blind people uh, changing considerably. They have become an in impressive inspiration to disabled people all over Nepal. So the question is what are social enterprises doing? And what is the scale of their operation? So that is what this particular slide is talking about. They are solving social problems. How do they do it? And they are doing it by innovating and co-creating. I'll talk about co-creating in a minute. And they are offering empowerment, uh, they are generating empower empowerment. And this is in the form of moving people from being recipients of welfare benefits to people who actively create social value. For example, um, in the case of Skylight Cafe, these people who came out of prisons and who are homeless, who normally would expect some kind of handouts are now working in prime mainstream restaurants and having a sustainable livelihoods. And they are creating value for themselves and for their enterprises. So there is an empowerment. And some of the social enterprises are bidding for public service contracts, like the one I showed you about the health company, Nene. Uh, and they are present and active in a wide variety of sectors. You know, they are in healthcare, they are in energy, they are in education. And uh, 
in 2018, there were 85,000 social enterprises contributing uh, not five, not 10, but 35 billion pounds to the UK economy. So they have started playing a very significant role. And uh, the UK government has taken a leading role in promoting social enterprises. So what, what do social enterprises do? And as uh, scientists, uh, we are always interested in looking at the characteristics uh, and classification of social enterprises. So many of these social enterprises have a strong drive for financial uh, financial autonomy. They don't depend on just grants. They generate their own profits and they plow their profits back into the enterprises. And they have a very, very flexible uh, way of working, which is completely non-bureaucratic. They have horizontal structures and not a pyramid kind of structure. And of course, they, they are willing to take risks because they are like any other business. And the kind of risks they take is multiple. Uh, for example, in the case of Skylight Cafe, um, the, the kind of people they train have the risk of getting back into drugs uh, and due to that becoming homeless again. Um, in 2016, I set up a social enterprise in the southern part of India, where I did a very similar thing to what Skylight Cafe is doing. I, I recruited uh, 12 people, uh, did some training with them for six months, a lot of uh, counseling and of course professional training. And we set up a, a restaurant called Jiffy Grills. Uh, unfortunately due to COVID it is closed now, but it has been running for four years successfully. And some of the risks that I personally faced as the chairman of that particular enterprise was uh, you know, some of these people getting back into drugs, some of them getting back into violent behavior and so on. But that is something that any social enterprise has to contend with. And that is because we have a close understanding of uh, the groups that we are working with. And we have a commitment to these groups. And we, of course, uh, put a lot of emphasis on staff development and uh, we reinvest profits in the social aims of the business, which is to give sustainable livelihoods to marginalized people, open uh, opportunities for these marginalized groups to get into the mainstream labor markets and uh, you, you know, go on a path towards sustainable livelihoods. So as you know, uh, social and environmental problems are ubiquitous. They are there everywhere. Uh, so politicians, business leaders uh, are talking about um, endeavors that focus on social and environmental objectives. And of course, entrepreneurs are responding. Uh, le let me read the next uh, point, which is you know, social entrepreneurship, which Global Entrepreneurship Monitor defines broadly as a kind of activity, organization, or in initiative that is particularly social, environmental, or community uh, orientation is now a significant share of entrepreneurial activity around the world. However, there is a wide variety of rates across economies. Now, this Global Entrepreneurship Monitor is an organization which tracks entrepreneurship activity country-wise across the globe. And now they have pointed out how in most of the um, major economies and also developing economies, Social entrepreneurship is on the emergence. Okay, now this particular slide, you know, sorry. Uh, it's about how, um, sorry. Uh, how, how social enterprises, you know, follow a kind of a continuum if you put them together uh, with business enterprises. So if you look at the middle, on the one hand, you have business enterprises which focus on creating economic value for the organizations. They are you know, mostly focused on the financial goals and business mission of the organization. Whereas in the left side of uh, uh, the slide, you will see uh, GOs and so on, including social enterprises. Uh, are focusing on creating social value, which in many cases is um, action for social justice. You know, social value in terms of livelihood, sustainable livelihood, identity issues, 
uh, human rights, social inclusion, and of course, all of that through empowerment of marginalized groups. And you can situate a social enterprise in either side of the spectrum, and you can place them, you know, uh, in the upper part of the, the quadrant where, you know, enterprises are started by individuals and then at the lower uh, part of the quadrant where uh, the organizations or enterprises are started by collectives or institutions like even businesses. Well, I can give you numerous examples of how even businesses are now seeding social enterprises and supporting them on a, an ongoing uh, basis. And um, of course, as researchers, we are all very uh, keen on talking about classification. You know, uh, we pride ourselves in you know trying to understand types of social enterprises. I, here, I've listed uh, uh, the types of social enterprises. You know, which are community enterprises, social firms, cooperatives, credit unions, public sector spin-outs, uh, like the health one, hey, not just. Uh, social enterprise I talked about. And there are also, there are also trading arms of charities. Uh, there are charities uh, which also start social enterprises so that they, the profits from the social enterprise can be fed into the charitable activities. And of course we have fair trade organizations. Now, how and why social enterprises emerge? Um, that, that has been one of my uh, research questions. In fact, my PhD thesis was based on the um, how and why of uh, social enterprises. Now, the first step is the opportunity recognition and discovery. Now, if you compare it with the business innovation and business, uh, the startup of any starting point of any business is recognizing an opportunity and trying to exploit that opportunity so that you will be able to introduce goods and services into the market. So opportunity recognition is the starting point of any enterprise. And it's the same with social enterprises as well. So what is the opportunity recognition in social enterprise or a discovery of uh, an opportunity? And that is, it starts with the identification of a constituency with unmet or inadequately met needs. Now, this is very clear in the case of uh, seeing hands. Uh, these are people who are, you know, with unmet needs because they were completely marginalized as blind people. Uh, so that is one of the opportunities that social entrepreneurs uh, focus on. You know, uh, they are very laser focused on identifying a constituency. Okay. And there are other opportunities as well for social enterprises which is the possibility of coming up with processes in service provision, which could be overhauled or replaced. For example, the Warwickshire uh, Energy Production Company, you know, um, they, they came up with the alternate energy um, and they replaced uh, mainstream energy with the uh, alternate energy. And they also work in new markets to introduce goods services for transforming lives. And the second process that happens in the formation of social enterprises is what I call reframing. Reframing is looking at uh, a particular entity or group of people and giving them a different label. Now, instead of looking at uh, visually impaired people as people who are dependent on others who have to live on handouts, if you see them as possible value creators, then your mindset changes. How do we make them value creators? And that is what Rob and his wife did. You know, they gave them training in massage. Uh, so it's a different and unique way of looking at people and positioning them as an opportunity, which offers itself as a potential field of innovation. Now, let me give you an example uh, and to make this point in stronger terms. So I'm at the moment working uh, in a charity called Skills Enterprise. Now, Skills Enterprise is doing a lot of work with marginalized uh, women. Um, 
people who are on benefits and so on. And we have come across this problem of digital exclusion. And the last time uh, a report was uh, prepared on digital exclusion, in the UK, uh, it was discovered 19 million people are digitally excluded. Now, the issue with these women is they are eligible for uh, benefits, welfare benefits, okay? The universal credit. But the problem is this universal credit is available only online. Now, our government has been so, <laughs> so clever that they wanted to cut the costs of people running uh, these welfare centers who will be able to give advice to benefit seekers and they put it online. But the problem is many of these people have no access to devices. And even if they have access to devices, they don't have the knowledge of how to use these devices. As a result, it's a case of so near yet so far. They, they are eligible for benefits, but they cannot access it because they don't have devices. They don't know how to use devices. So our organization has been giving them um, training, uh, upskilling them in uh, the digital skills. Let me try and see if I can. So um, we have been running it for um, more than two years now. And I'll, I'll... So we started finding the money to give them the tablet as well, apart from the training. And that is Mala, one of my students who was in the uh, BA social enterprise that I ran. Uh, and she uh, was the one who, uh, was instrumental in the setting up of this organization and I work as a trustee in this organization. Now, I kind of push them towards uh, training. We give them tablets. Should they continue to be on benefits? What about you know pushing them towards becoming value creators for themselves and for the community? So we have come up with a sustainable livelihood project. I'm, I'm just telling you the story of how a social enterprise gets formed, you know, how uh, an organization moves from being a charity to becoming an enterprise, okay? So because I pushed them towards a sustainable uh, livelihood project, I, I kind of, I did not give them any ideas. I was just asking questions and I was just showing them opportunities. And uh, they had a consultation uh, with the stakeholders with all the people who are on uh, benefits, with some of the local community workers uh, uh, and also uh, workers from the local authority. And now they have come up with the idea of a community cloud kitchen. Now, what is this uh, cloud kitchen? Now, it's a catering business. It's a community enterprise because many of these women have something in common and that is their skills in cooking. So, you know, I was just telling them, in fact, we had a session of eating <laughs> their cuisines. Uh, I'm a foodie, by the way, anyway. So uh, now we are working on a tie up with Uber Eats so that, you know, there will be preparation of multi cuisine and authentic ethnic offerings. And there will be a tie up with Uber. And we are also working on tie-ups with farmers cooperatives so that we can get our produce supplied straight to us instead of middlemen. And uh, we are working on crowdfunding. And we are also working with East London Business Alliance, which is a, a collaborative membership organization, which works with about 130 multinationals who are all based in Canary Wharf. So they are going to work with us in terms of branding and so on. So, this is how a social enterprise gets formed. So that's why I wanted to share this with you. And then of course, the next process in a, a social enterprise formation is accessing and assembling uh, a diverse source of uh, uh, capitals, you know, what we call social capital, financial capital, cultural capital, and political capital as well. And we seek ambassadors who uh, will, you know, uh, stand with us and who will be our voices, like our alliance with East London uh, Business uh, Alliance. Um, and there is a kind of a collective learning and innovation. Now, this whole idea of Cloud Kitchen emerged in this consultation because they were trying to ask themselves, what are we good at? What can we do well? And what can we marketize? 
without selling our souls. And that is how they came up with this idea of cloud kitchen. So there is a kind of a multi-level learning. And now we are bringing in trainers who will train them in industrial uh, cooking. Okay, and we've also got in touch with the, a big uh, industrial kitchen, which belongs to a church. So there are some, these kind of linkages, the social networking, which is called social capital, that has to happen for a social enterprise to survive and succeed. And of course, we have the task of a prototype creation, which we are going to do in the next couple of months. And that is how a social enterprise gets formed and then succeeds, sustains itself and succeeds. Now, there's a huge potential for social enterprises. They are gaining increasing recognition. Uh, in fact, I work in countries uh, uh, like uh, Norway and uh, Sweden and Denmark. And there's a lot of support uh, for social entrepreneurship and social enterprises. And even in Europe, um, when dealing with the, the issues of people uh, coming from you know, countries like Syria and so on, the whole influx of refugees, now they are also moving towards setting up social enterprises with them instead of making them dependent on benefits and handouts. So, and there is also more professionalization in the sector. There are people who are coming out of MBAs, business schools and so on, who are getting into uh, the field, especially in a country like India, there are more than 200,000 social enterprises which are run by you know, business school uh, graduates. Uh, there is uh, public policy which is supporting uh, social enterprises. Uh, and there is a momentum that's going on, of course, with the methodical and sustained uh, support. We can ease the pr pressure of welfare provisions because what's happening now is the public policy is moving towards cutting welfare provisions. So who steps into the gap and who is going to solve the problem of inequality? The government is not going to do that because they say they don't have the funds. The private sector is not going to do that because their focus is on their business mission and maximizing profits and increase, increasing the value for their shareholders. So it has to be social enterprises simply because without Revenue generation, without making a surplus, you cannot survive and you cannot succeed. And for government agencies, now it's becoming an attractive policy option. So now my final question to all of you, how do I participate in these initiatives? So any thoughts, anyone wants to share their thoughts? Christina, you want to go first? Sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, I can definitely go first. I mean, to be honest, uh, well, thank you for all the examples that you have given because there, there are so many things out there that one does not know, or at least I didn't know. Um, I try to, I try to, to find these initiatives like restaurants, as you were mentioning. I knew about a couple of these, and and I, I try to go. I try to to buy there but I don't know how I could kind of participate in, I don't know, like, like giving, giving some maybe money so that these bigger uh, co-creation projects can run or, so I don't know whether that's through NGOs. So I participate more in an individual uh, way, like trying to, if I know about these initiatives, I try to go to these places and, and, and consume things from there. Uh, but yeah, I don't know how to participate in, in more of a bigger scale on, on, on the... Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, some individuals might find it a bit awkward and difficult. How do we participate? It's very simple. Time, talent, and skills. You can give your time. You can share your talent. And of course, you can build their capacity by sharing your skills. You know, you may be uh, an engineer, but you might have some organizational skills. You might have leadership skills. You might have time management skills. So you can kind of build up the capacity of the social enterprises by offering your skills and your participation. Okay, so that's another way of doing that. So I, I open the floor for normal questions. 
Christina, if you can take over. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, thank you for your talk, uh, Dr. Gladius. And uh, it's again, uh, I, yeah, I find these initiatives just is amazing. I, I don't know whether someone has some questions. Um, okay, so uh, I don't, I don't see any at the moment. So just people, please, if you have any questions, just start um, sharing them in the chat. I, I, I'm going to then take over and I have maybe a couple of questions. So when, when you mention actually, um, again, like private organizations, not really, I mean, it's, it's not in their mission uh, to address this. Uh, I know there are like, there are certain benefits to them from let's say taxation side of things uh, when they um, hire people with, with certain uh, discapacities or impairment or from marginalized backgrounds. Uh, do you think that has to be also pushed forward, uh, like in parallel to perhaps um, these initiatives? But do you think that, that somehow the government should be pushing private organizations to, to get more people into their... Um, no, the, the government uh, uh, cannot do that because uh, they cannot be prescriptive. Uh, it has to come uh, from the side of the business organizations. Uh, now the government has created a new form of in the company law. You know, they uh, formed something called CIC, community interest companies. You can set up companies which act as social enterprises. So instead of having a business mission, they have a strong a social mission. There is also another thing that is happening, which is a very interesting uh, development, which is called a social business. You might have heard about the company called Danone, which is a French company, which is into milk products and butter and so on. There are many of you might have heard, it's a multinational company. Now, Bangladesh has uh, done a deal, you know, Mohammed Yunus, who got a Nobel uh, Prize and who's a very well-known leader in the movement of social enterprises. Uh, he's uh, formed a company called Grameen Bank, which is uh, a bank which offers micro loans to marginalized groups, you know. So he did a deal with Danone, which is a kind of an excellent deal because they are producing nutritious milk, which is being distributed by rural women. And they act as their distributors in Bangladesh. So it's a, it has a double benefit. It is a business because it is selling milk, but it is a nutritious milk, which is tailored to that particular climate and those nutritional values and uh, the employees are rural women who never went to school or college or whatever so it's offering sustainable livelihoods and it's also impacting the nutrition levels of the children another example that i can give is i'm at the moment working uh, with a, an african lady who has uh, done her doctorate in public health and she has come up with a new form of pasteurizing soya milk and uh, infusing it with nutrients. And she is trying to set up a factory in Nigeria so that she can supply to the sub-Saharan market, you know, a nutritious milk. So she herself is dealing with it. And we are uh, in the last stages of, I, I'm the consultant to that project. And we are in the last stage of doing a deal, a 10 million pound deal uh, with a funder. Uh, so it'll be, it'll be a proper business, you know, uh, but, uh, we are going to source uh, soya uh, from uh, the African continent. We are going to promote soya bean cultivation. Uh, but it's a new process which has been patented by this uh, lady, uh, uh, Dr. Vivian. Uh, so these are some of the ways in which the world is beginning to look at how we can solve social problems. Because what is happening is when you are focused only on your business mission, you're trying to lose out on the social mission. And people are beginning to realize we cannot go on like that because sustainability becomes an issue because we are damaging the environment. So now people are, even business leaders, because I teach business leaders uh, as a program manager of an MBA because I'm running the MBA program. They are looking at people, profit, planet. These three Ps have become prominent in the thinking of business leaders, you know, 
how do we help people how do we of course keep profit as one of our central pursuits because we have to answer to the shareholders and how do we take care of the planet so people profit planet this becomes uh, you know the clarion call of even business leaders so th- there is a kind of a shift that is going on but it is under the radar at the moment but people like me who act as ambassadors or evangelists for this movement are spreading uh, the you know gospel <laughs> no it's 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 great because to be honest a couple of weeks ago we had a talk um which was more linked to how how law like how regulations can can help in uh yeah there, there, there are many governments which have passed uh, regulations and new laws for example in india the indian government has passed a company act and it's called company act uh, 25 where you can set up a social enterprise as a company you can pay the people i mean you can act like a charity but you can actually pay professional market level fees uh, and compensation to your employees and you can run as a business the only condition is that you have to reinvest your profit into the organization and into the social mission for which your organization was started so there are lots of initiatives that are going on around the world but it's all under the radar and behind the curtains so people like me are <laughs> trying to move yeah. to pull the threads here and there to make it work and to make it happen no that's great because because i was as i was mentioning that all the talk we were um uh, somehow discussing more kind of um let's say a bit more like the f- fundamentals of regulations on directly kind of more climate change and how we how we do that some people asked in the chat i remember about how can we integrate you know the awareness of of, of the, the climate change consequences in in education so there was a bit of that sort of um again it was so uh related to the businesses itself so we were a bit like you know but businesses are running all these big companies and maybe not doing much about it so knowing that it seems to be it is being it is beginning to happen and even governments are passing Uh, laws for example indian government passed a law which makes it compulsory for major corporation to set aside 1% of their profit every year for corporate social responsibility activities uh, where you know they start funding social enterprises which is now on top of their list of priorities okay so, so 1% to- of profit of you know huge corporations is sizable amount of uh, funds so even governments are beginning to support this because they realize that they cannot solve these social problems on their own they cannot wipe out inequality so they have to pull in enterprise because the enterprise has the power to transform neighborhoods communities which i discovered when i was a little boy you know so everybody is trying to realize you cannot just give handouts or you cannot you know uh, give uh, grants to local authorities and ask them to solve a problem try to promote enterprises which will take it as their social mission to solve these problems which find a way of marketizing you know some of uh, their services and make revenue out of that which can be fed into meeting their social mission and transforming lives that's you know it's it's it's, it's very impressive and i'm happy that again that that um businesses like private sector is also having a bit of a role there or a, a big one actually i was going to check there are a couple of questions now actually i don't know whether the first one is by henriette i don't know whether henriette if you want to maybe just uh, unmute yourself and ask otherwise i can go for it but ju- just in case yeah i can just quickly ask the question myself so i think because um you know the the social enterprises are also businesses I guess there is a risk that at some point the original values get forgotten and it becomes about making profits. So what what do you do what do you put in place to make sure that a social enterprise maintains its original aims? Yeah, there is a phenomenon called mission drift which is what you are you know talking about. Yeah. And there are certain um provisions that you have to put in place uh, the first provision is that all the profit that the organization makes should be reinvested into the organization to meet with the social mission 
and the leadership should be following a flat structure there shouldn't be a hierarchy and that should be a rotation of leaders and the most important aspect that is people for whom your enterprise is set up should participate in the decision making so you create a kind of a loop so that you don't uh, have a mission drift so there are people who, who will pull you back you know that provision is already there so people are still struggling with it i, I don't want to pretend that you know it's all hunky dory and you know <laughs> we're all going to heaven you know it, it's not as simple as that but these are problems you know these are happy problems that we love to you know mm. encounter and confront head on yeah. thanks okay, for okay thank you yeah, thank you uh, there is a second question by Lina. I don't know, Lina, if you want to uh, maybe um, ask yourself, otherwise I can just pass it. No, maybe I can go for it. So Lina is mentioning that jails in Kerala, in India, sells food prepared by inmates and inmates get paid for the work. Okay, so it's, it's a bit of an example that this raised uh, a few eyebrows initially, uh, but now those counters have long queues. Okay, acceptance is of such yes. enterprise by community is of utmost importance. Yeah, I guess that's yeah. like... That's yeah, this is another example of uh, the idea of the cloud kitchen I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the exactly. community cloud kitchen. In this case, it happens to be the community of inmates, that's all, yeah. So thanks, Lena. thanks for that uh, mention, yeah. And I come from a neighboring state, so I know uh, how Kerala uh, is a highly advanced thinking kind of activity. Yeah. Perfect. So there is there is another question uh, by Mark. Uh, how does uh, Dr. Kolatungan uh, see the role of social innovation in a post-COVID world? See, uh, to be honest, I would say that uh, social innovation plays and will play a critical role uh, in restructuring of different sections of society post-COVID because uh, we have a swathe of uh, groups which have been left by the wayside and uh, rehabilitating them and bringing them back into mainstream economy uh, and bringing people back into the mainstream labor force is something that we have to do uh, only through social innovation. I run social innovation workshops across the world where we sit with people who have been affected by these issues, people who are facing inequality, people who are facing marginalization, who have identity issues and so on. And we co-create with them. We don't innovate for them. We innovate together with them because people who are experiencing inequality have an inkling of how to overcome inequality because they are immersed in that. So they have a kind of an inkling. They have an intuitive feeling of how to get out of it. So we don't helicopter ourselves into that kind of a situation. We co-create with them. And that is how social innovation should work. We don't give the answers. We generate the answers from the people who are experiencing inequality at first hand. So post COVID, it will be social innovation which has the capacity to work on regeneration. We have to regenerate swathes of uh, society. This is a slightly different question. It's also COVID related, but I was just wondering if there is any of your initiatives, uh, like any of the maybe businesses that you see coming up with, with uh, the co-creation um, projects that you do maybe uh, help in these days. Is there anything directly related with COVID or that's a bit difficult and potentially more technical to... No, uh, th there is one group of uh, uh, young uh, students in our university who are working on high technology uh, solutions. Because see, we have moved into kind of innovation economy. Uh, we, we are not in the industrial or manufacturing economy anymore. So even for social enterprises, we have to move into the innovation economy. It, it's no point, you know, trying to mimic or reproduce the established enterprises. We have to go beyond those and come, come up with innovative business models. So social innovation will go, in a, uh, go a long way in working with high technology uh, 
sector as well. So, on, yeah, great. So, so good to know that there's also, again, like initiatives going for yeah. uh, more like, yeah, new technologies being developed. Uh, that's, that's really good. So I'm not sure whether someone has like a very, very last minute question, because otherwise I think we should be wrapping up because uh, it's seven already. Uh, and it's you, you've done a good job, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> so Rounding I, off on time. Well, I've, I've yeah, it's it's yeah, quite quite um, quite tight there. But I think it's been perfect. Um, and thank you for your time. Uh, we hope you can come next time and tell us more about new initiatives and how we can know more about them. I encourage everyone to maybe just like do a bit of research about um, what you do, which projects you're working on, and probably from there um, try and, and uh, you know, take a more active role. And as you were mentioning, uh, you know, giving, giving uh those skills that we may have, uh, even maybe if they are a bit hidden, <laughs> in my case, for business management. Uh, but yeah, I think all of us have some of those skills already. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll flag up something. If you invite me again, I'm going to talk about the topic, spiritual but not religious. What on earth do we mean by that? I'm just joking. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I'm serious. I'm, I'm following that. I'm writing a book on that anyway. So. Okay, well, so yeah, definitely I think we should invite you then because, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, I find it very... That is because of my uh, involvement in the creative industries and I've met lots of crazy people, you know. Oh, uh, so definitely, <laughs> yeah, okay, so, so I think you can write quite a lot of stories from there. Exactly. <laughs> can imagine, yeah. So thank you so much for having me and it has been a pleasure and hopefully, you know, um, I've offered some kind of an inspirational look into social enterprises. Yeah, I think so. I think it's it's been uh, very, very um, inspiring. Uh, and I hope again, people will, will look more into, into these projects and try to help. Uh, so Gladius, thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone else for joining. And I hope uh, way more people will also see this, this talk on YouTube uh, after this. So Gladius, I hope to see you very soon. And everyone, take Likewise. care. See you next time. Yeah. Bye for now. Bye bye. Au revoir. <laughs>